as I mentioned in the last class, this picture of the gauge cycle is something that you should really become familiar with. Okay. So, just as a quick recap, the key events in the gate cycle, one gate cycle is from say initial contact to initial contact of the same leg, then you have initial contact. The, so, the events various events are initial contact, the opposite leg toes off, okay. then slowly the stance leg, the heel rises in the stance leg and then the opposite leg, the other leg contacts the ground because that has completed its swing. Then you have toe off of this leg, the leg of interest and then as it is swinging through the two feet are adjacent and after that you have the tibia becomes vertical and the leg swings through to attain the posture for the next contact with the ground. So, heel contact or initial contact of one leg to initial contact of the same leg constitutes one gait cycle and then we identified the phases. So, initial contact is an event, but that is an important event to indicate the start of gait and loading response is the phase between initial contact and opposite toe off, then opposite toe off to heel rise, when only one leg is in contact with the ground now, because once the opposite leg lifts up the ground, you have only one leg, the brown leg is your stance leg single support leg and that first attains mid stance, when the body kind of rolls over that and then from heel rise to opposite initial contact. So, this phase is your single support phase, okay, where only the brown leg is supporting the entire body weight. And then, so this here is your first double support, this is single support of in this case right leg. Then you have the second double support, which is marked by the stance leg going into pre swing, okay, going into the uh, going through the pre swing phase from opposite initial contact to toe off of this leg. And then when this leg is in swing, the leg of interest, the brown leg, that is the time that the other leg is in single support phase of the left leg. Okay. So, two double supports, two single supports. Each leg goes through one single support and two double supports. So, it is in stance. So, each leg is in stance for about 60 percent of the gait cycle. and in swing for 40 percent of the gait cycle. Okay. So, this set of coordinated movements, um, we find that among human beings, there is a fairly definite pattern in which the movements at the joints occur causing this. So, even though you know you can you can tell a person you can recognize a person by their gait, you know you can see a person far away and I can say I, I know who that is by their gait. 
So, there are enough distinctions you know among human beings where you can even use it for recognizing a person, but at the same time there are some broad patterns which are uniform across uh, you know uniform in the way that we walk and that is the reason we are able to actually study this in this manner, because you will see that these patterns are repetitive and these patterns lie in a fairly narrow band for most people especially in the sagittal plane. You see much more difference in the frontal plane motions, because those motions are also small and that sort of characterizes some of their differences. But in the sagittal plane if you look at the motions of the different at about the different joints, there is a fairly narrow band in which are uh, especially if you are looking at like an age range of say 25 to 40 you know adult um, adulthood if you look at uh, that you will see that the patterns are quite similar. Of course, a lot of the data that is available um, is mainly for Caucasian populations. Okay. Uh, hopefully, one of the things our lab is also trying to do is we want to collect data for say the Indian population and look at how it fits in with the data that is available. Uh, uh, but there is reason to believe that in most cases the patterns will be more or less the same. So, that is the uh, so these events and these phases are recognizable across the board. So, in most cases of what is termed normal walking you will be able to identify these this kind of a pattern. So, if you look at the view from the what plane is this view from transverse plane. So, if you look at the view from the transverse plane you will see that when we walk we actually have a slight toe out angle of the foot is called the toe out angle. So, you have this direction of progression and your feet are structured in such a way that there is a slight toe out angle. And then if you look at the walking base you know we do not walk one foot in front of the other that is what a somebody would do if they are walking on a tight rope right they would place one foot directly in front of the other. Uh, but in general we have a finite walking base we uh, um, and this base can again vary with the way people you know people walk with different between men and women you can see differences in the walking base. You can see differences as you age you can see differences between children and adults etcetera. So, the walking base is this distance that you see here. So, the right step length is the distance that the right leg swings through in front of the left foot. So, from here to here till it touches the right swings through and touches the ground okay. that distance is the right step length. Okay. So, this leg is in swings forward and plants on the ground here and this distance then is the right step length. Similarly, the ref left step length. So, you have that this is one gait cycle right left heel contact to left heel contact. So, that is one stride. So, that length is one stride length and then you have the left step length is the distance between where the right leg the heel of the right leg touches the ground to where the heel of the left leg now touches the ground swings forward how much the left leg swings forward. So, in normal gait these two step lengths are equal. So, we call normal gait as symmetric in other kinds of gait we will see that this may not normally be the case. Okay. So, you may have a st left step length that is 
shorter than the right stepped or vice versa. An example would be say you are wearing an artificial leg, okay. you have a prosthesis. Okay. So, you want to spend less time on the prosthesis. So, you would swing forward quickly with your good leg and so the step length of the good leg would actually be shorter because you are trying to quickly get back onto your good leg. You do not you, you don't want to let it swing for too long because you do not want to uh, you are not as sure about spending time on your prosthetic leg. Okay. So, that is so if there is a shorter step length it is likely that the problem is with the other leg. So, if the right step length is shorter it is likely that the problem is with the left leg. We will we'll see that when we come to the pathological gait, but something to remember. So, if there is with one leg it is likely that the problem is with the other leg. Okay. Symmetric or normal gait has two equal steps. Now, some more terminology with respect to gait. We typically talk about cadence. Cadence is the number of steps per minute that you take. So, steps per minute is cadence. The cycle time is the time for one gate cycle, right. So, that is why you have a 120 here 60 into 2. This is cycle time is measured in seconds, okay. cadence is per minute. So, for 60 seconds, since you are talking about the cycle, you are talking about two steps. Okay. So, that is why the 120 comes there. 120 divided by cadence is your cycle time, and the average speed is the distance covered per unit time, as we all know. So, the three are related, you can relate the speed to the stride length and the cycle time. It is basically just the stride length divided by in meter per second is stride length divided by the cycle time. And the we all tend to walk at a self selected walking speed and that average of that speed is about 1.3 to 1.4 meter per second. That is considered most people's self selected walking speed. This is the average self selected. So, most gate studies would ask the person to walk at their self selected walking speed and it has been found that uh, around this speed is when you are tr minimizing your energy cost of walking. Okay. So, based on that we walk we normally walk. So, 
at higher and lower speeds you actually tend to consume more energy. So, this is the self selected walking speed that we usually adopt. So, we will now look at the motions about the various joints that happen during this gait cycle. So, the major joints that we are looking at are the hip, the knee and the ankle, joints of the lower limb, the hip, the knee and the ankle. And most of this data is usually expressed in terms of percentage of gait cycle. So, you say the gait cycle, one gait cycle is a hundred percent, then you divide that up and you look at. So, so these are the various events. You have I C initial contact, opposite toe off, heel rise, opposite initial contact, toe off, feet adjacent, tibia vertical and initial contact corresponding to the other figure that we have. And then flexion extension. So, if you have the hip, right, you are talking about hip flexion in this direction, extension in this direction. And in most cases, so here for example, we are talking about angles from say the vertical. So, if you have that would be your hip flexion angle. So, you can see that the hip the range of motion at the hip required for walking is about 30 degrees of flexion to about 20 degrees of extension. So, 30 degrees in this direction 20 degrees from the vertical in that direction is the range of motion at the hip. At the knee, you have knee flexion in this direction. Okay. So, from the vertical, you have So, if you are standing straight, your knee angle is considered to be 0 degrees. 0 degrees is full knee extension. And if it goes beyond, so if it goes the other way, like slightly, then that is your knee extension. or hyper extension actually, because that is not 0 is considered the normal state of the extended knee. And then for the ankle you have if this is the 0 position the neutral position. So, if you have the neutral position of the ankle like this, then this is your dorsiflexion. So, this is measured from the horizontal this angle and this is your plantar flexion. The neutral <coughs> position is with the tibia vertical and the foot flat that is your 0 ankle <coughs> angle. Okay, so, the knee you see that you can have a maximum of sometimes 50 or 60 degrees of flexion. You, you have a large range of motion at the knee and that happens during swing, it happens during swing. So, we will look at each of the uh, different stages of gait and look at the motions. So, if you look at the stance limb, so this is how stance happens. So, you have heel contact you saw them separately initially right. So, during stance what happens the foot contacts the ground goes down flat and then then you know it stays there till it in space it 
it stays at that point. You know in the previous slide when we saw the different ones it looked like it is, but in stance actually the foot stays in one location. Okay, in the stance if you look at the stance limb the foot stays in one uh, location and so the entire stance phase happens with the foot in that particular location. And really the forward progression that is happening is of the limbs above the foot, okay. limbs of the above the foot and the rest of the body is moving forward, it is basically pivoting about this fixed uh, foot. And of course, then towards the end of stance the foot also starts lifting off the ground. So, if you look at the stance phase, then you have the task is what was the first task of stance? If you remember th when it first contacts the ground, it has to accept the weight. The first task is weight acceptance and this weight acceptance implies that you have to have some kind of shock absorption because you have a moving limb that is being suddenly stopped by the ground, okay, contacting the ground. So, there is an impact at the point of contact. So, the limb has to have some mechanism for shock absorption, so that all those loads do not get trans. So, you know if you are walking with um, hard shoes on a hard floor, you can feel, you can feel the shock, you can feel the shock even or if you are walking fast, because now you have a fast moving swinging limb suddenly stopped by the ground. So, you feel the shock when you, uh, so shock absorption is an important uh, function that is needed during this weight acceptance. Then of course, you need to have stability. You have an articulated set of limbs that are making contact with the ground. If so, now you are applying a load to two bars that are connected by say a joint, right. For them to not buckle. When I say buckle here I mean for them to not collapse. Okay. So, buckling in is not the same as the buckling that we use when we talk about columns. Okay. There is a difference in the when we talk about knee buckling in biomechanics, we are talking about the knee allowing the body to collapse. Okay. So, maintaining when you st when you are applying load on that limb, okay, it is necessary to maintain that stability of the limb, so that the knee does not buckle and you do not fall down. And of course, because the function of walking is to progress forward, you have to preserve that progression even when the foot is on the ground, you cannot just stop there. Okay, you have to preserve the progression. So, these are the functional requirements when you are talking about weight acceptance, you are talking about some shock absorption that needs to be there, some initial uh, this limb has to be stable enough to accept the weight and it also has to continue moving forward. So, the body has to continue moving forward while it is in the stance phase as well. Because the whole purpose of this weight acceptance is you are trying to, the need is to transfer the body weight abruptly to a limb that has just finished.
swinging forward. And also it has an unstable alignment. Okay, you have uh, it is a jointed limb and you also you will also find that the way the ground reaction force acts will be to actually bend the limb okay, to bend the shank with the, uh, so to make the knee buckle. So, maintaining the stability becomes a very key. Uh, so, of course, the phase the in initial contact what happens is the foot just touches the floor and you have what is known as we will we'll look at that the body now. So, it pivots about the heel. Okay. The foot touches the floor and now that is the pivot about which you are going to have motion. So, heel acts as a pivot. And in the loading response phase, you basically have again you need to have some shock absorption because more of the body weight is being transferred to the limb and weight bearing stability because it is going to start assuming full responsibility for the weight bearing. At the end of loading response the other limb is going to lift off the ground you have opposite toe off which means this has to and of course, again preservation of progression. So, functionally this is what the limb has to accomplish in the uh, initial part of stance. So, this is initial contact you can see from initial contact you can see that the limb pivots about an axis passing through the heel. Okay. So, this is called a heel rocker initially during loading response the foot pivots about the heel and then comes down flat on the ground. So, from heel contact to foot flat this is your pivot okay. the heel uh, you have uh, the foot pivoting about the heel. So, the reason from a single point of contact or a small area now you have the entire foot making contact with the ground which is necessary for the weight acceptance because you are trying to get that base of support to start loading the limb further. Okay. So, this is the initial stance phase. Then if you look at mid stance what happens is here Now, the foot is flat on the ground okay, and the ankle starts functioning as the pivot. Initially, you had the heel, the foot pivoted about the heel and landed flat on the ground. Now, in mid stance, the the upper portions of the limb limbs start pivoting about the ankle the tibia starts pivoting about the ankle to move forward because the entire foot is now flat on the ground and the function is so in this essentially one limb has the entire responsibility
for supporting the body weight in both planes. in both the sagittal and the frontal planes, because the other limb is now off the ground and frontal planes. So, stability is a very important uh, aspect of this phase and you have to continue the progression while continuing forward progression, because all these events, all these phases are happening with continued forward progression. There is no going back and forth. Okay, let me do this, come here, then there is a continuous forward progression happening as you walk. So, in mid stance, when is mid stance opposite toe off to heel rise okay opposite toe off to heel rise when you have that you have progression over the stationary foot And of course, you have to maintain stability of the entire system. So, that and stability are the functions in mid stance. In terminal stance, now the body has moved over. So, if you see here, after mid stance, in terminal stance, the body weight has actually moved ahead of the supporting foot. You see the last two here, the body weight has now moved, the body weight is now ahead of the supporting foot. Initially, it was behind the supporting foot, goes over the supporting foot in mid stance and now it is ahead of the supporting foot in terminal stance and you have So, you are basically maintaining the forward progression. So, the function of this terminal stance is move the body weight ahead of the supporting foot, that is the function in So, this in the single support phase stability while maintaining progression is the key task. Okay, this is the key task. Pre swing gets you into the swing phase. Okay, now, by this time, when you are in the pre swing period, you are again in the other double support period. So, stability wise, you are okay. Okay, what you are doing now is transferring to the other foot. The other foot has made contact with the ground and you that is basically entering stance phase. So, it is going through what this um, leg went through uh, just before this. Okay. So, in this essentially the task in swing is to advance the limb in preparation for the next support phase. So, if you see here 
this has to if you look at this one which shows the entire swing limb you see that once the foot lifts off the ground it swings up and then swings forward in preparation for the next stance way. So, uh, once it comes here then it is going to again make contact with the ground and the cycle repeats. So, each leg goes through this alternating uh, task, it supports then moves forward supports moves forward and the two legs take turns right the right leg supports then the left leg assumes the support this starts moving forward again that that leg then starts moving forward. So, you have this alternating pattern between the two legs. So, in the pre swing phase, the objective is to position the limb for swing. So, get ready for swinging forward, and this is also called weight release because right now you in order to be able to lift that leg you have to unload this limb. So, this is it basically unloads the limb in this phase because the other limb is now accepting the weight. So, you have to unload this limb then it swings forward gravity assists it in the swing phase. So, initially it lifts off then comes to rest and starts swinging forward like a pendulum. Okay. But there is one when you are in the swing phase there are some important objectives. So, this is unloading it starts moving forward such that the two feet are adjacent. Then here it is very important in swing that there is foot clearance. If the swing does not happen properly what is going to happen? You are going to stumble. The swing has to happen in a clean manner such that the foot clears the ground no part of the foot touches the ground while it is swinging. That is why if there is a sudden ob obstacle sometimes you know you are in a rhythm of walking and if you do not notice the obstacle what happens? Your and it tries to do it in a very efficient manner. So, that is why we do not lift it very high and then swing it forward because that is going to take energy. So, you lift it just enough to swing it forward to clear the ground. So, if you encounter an unexpected obstacle then what happens the swinging leg hits that and you stumble okay, because your body is tuned. So, if you are walking on level ground you have a certain rhythm your body you know adapts to that. If not if you are walking on uneven ground you have to make it is it's a little bit more effort because you have to consciously clear obstacles when you are swinging. Okay. So, foot clearance is an important uh, aspect functional aspect of the swing phase. So, this is an important aspect of the swing phase and in the terminal swing which is from the tibia vertical to the next initial contact. So, you see here tibia vertical to next initial contact this is from toe off no from feet adjacent to 
tibia vertical. So, you have the terminal swing, your limb advancement is completed and you want the limb to prepare for weight acceptance. Okay. So, the leg, the shank moves ahead of the thigh. in terminal swing. So, you are essentially completing the limb advancement. And you have to prepare the limb for stance for the next stance. So, if you look at the hip motion, if you start off with a flexed hip, say this is initial contact, you are starting off with a flex, flexed hip, it moves in the direction of extension and then flexion. Okay. So, in the gauge cycle, it extends and then flexes again. If you look at the knee, the knee flexes, you have knee flexion initially, we will we'll talk about individual stages, then it ex extends, flexes again, then it extends. So, two cycles of flexion and extension, hip one cycle of flexion, then one of extension. And then with the ankle you have it plantar flexes, then dorsiflexes, then again plantar flexes, dorsiflexes and comes to neutral. Yes. Initial contact there will be some amount of dorsiflexion. So, towards when it prepares for initial contact, it actually comes back to neutral. So, like I said, there will be individual variations, but see because you want to go from neutral to a plantar flex state, when you have foot flat, when it pivots about the heel, you are going to a plantar flex state. So, your direction of motion is from dorsiflexion to plantar flexion. So, to be properly positioned for stance, the ankle actually comes to the neutral position at a point initial contact. So, we will look. So, if you look at the action of the foot, so you have initially this is your pivot, the heel is your pivot you are rocking about the heel. When you make contact first, you have the heel rocker. Then as the body progresses over mid stance, you have the ankle rocker. So, the point, the pivot point and the foot moves from the heel to the ankle. Okay. The whole bo body is now pivoting about the ankle this is the motion that is happening. Initially, you just have the foot pivoting about the heel to plant on the ground. Then you have the tibia pivoting about the tibia and the rest of the body above pivoting about the ankle. And then in the final stages of stance, once your heel is off the ground, you are actually pivoting about the forefoot. Okay. So, the action of the foot, the, the pivot point in the foot keeps changing. So, the foot is on the ground, you know. The, so, when, when it starts off in stance, it pivots about the heel. Then once it is planted on the ground, once it, once it attains foot flat by pivoting about the heel, 
then it now starts the foot is flat on the ground it cannot move then everything starts pivoting about the ankle joint that becomes the pivot for the body to progress forward and then as the heel so as the body weight moves ahead of this foot the heel starts lifting from the ground and then the pivot point at the foot becomes the forefoot. So, these are called the three rockers of the foot. You have the heel rocker, the ankle rocker and the forefoot rocker. Okay. And there is research that shows that these three actions can actually be captured by like a rolling motion. So, if you had a rolling foot Okay, so, if you had a foot that was shaped like this, okay, these three motions kind of combine are similar to a circular arc rolling on the ground. Okay, they are kind of equivalent to that kind of a motion. Okay, and in fact, your uh, project for this course one of the projects has to do with finding this rocker experimentally. You can find what is the um, equivalent rocker that will create this kind of motion, okay, geometrically reproduce the same motion. Okay. So, we will continue in the next class.